Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to be back here at Art Center. It was my home for four years, and uh, it's just awesome every time I come back. <laughs> it's a bit true. Okay. So, I'm Yuna, I'm a designer based in New York City. I'm also an artist and an activist. It's hard for me to really define myself with one word, but when I think about what I do, I actually spend most of my time thinking how to get myself out of uncomfortable situations. So if there's something ugly in front of me, I'm either going to put it away or I'm going to try to make it prettier, because I like pretty things. If I'm in an uncomfortable environment, I'm either going to try to get away, if I should get away, or I'm going to try to change it, and if that's too hard, and there are forces way bigger than me that are actually shaping it, I'm going to try to change how I perceive it. So I was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and uh, I flew all the way to Art Center from there. Being from Beirut is uh, both the best thing that ever happened to me, and also very hard, because it means that there's a set of realities that I have to deal with and to accept. So this is what Beirut looks like today. The country has been on an emergency garbage management plan since 1997. There are 1.4 million refugees. It's actually one in five people. And you only get electricity for four hours a day, if you're lucky, depending on where you live. But it's very polluted as well. This is what Beirut looked like last week. There was a revolution. Uh, I was myself protesting in New York City, because people have had enough. And I can keep going on and on and show you images of Beirut from 2006, from 1999, uh, from 2001, etc. But when I think of Beirut and when I think of my home, I smell sand and I see beaches and I see my father building a bungalow for me in his mountain home. I see my mom putting me in her car every day after school and driving me to ballet lessons and piano lessons and drawing lessons. I see my grandmother um, making me skip school days to take me to the beach with her twice a month. <laughs> if I got good grades, I would get to keep doing that, so I just had to have good grades. And the idea of reshaping my environment and how I see it is really how I was brought up. I grew up with a magician at home, seriously. This is my uncle, and he, everything he touches becomes magical. I grew up an only child and had imaginary friends. I used to run around the, the dining table and dance with them. I would see them, but I, th I think he saw them too. In French, <laughs> you say canard for duck. Uh, I, my pronunciation wasn't quite there yet, so I said nanar instead of canard. And nanar turned into this. <laughs> he created a character out of it. And with the character came this. Nana and multiple of all my childhood friends became real life characters. And he wrote musicals and, and uh, theater plays and a TV show out of my childhood. So I grew up seeing what I was imagining becoming real. And I saw my family sharing what was our house culture with thousands of people. That was Beirut in 2012. I was back for the two and a half short week break that we get in August. And it was the worst for six summer since 1946. Again, I found myself having to deal with a tough situation, looking at my parents getting older and the news that they watch all day, every day, not making their features, you know, any better. It's, it just breaks my heart to see them having to deal with this. And that same uncle, the magician, had the idea of, after seeing a friend coming from Brazil with a wish bracelet, of making a bracelet for Lebanon and calling it Live Love Lebanon. My friend Eddie was crazy enough to believe in his idea, and by the time I got back to Art Center, he had sent me a proof of a bracelet uh, with Live Love Lebanon written on it, with the colors of our flag, and the font was Comic Sense. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is the 
the absolute best way of provoking a designer. <laughs> Literally, 65 seconds later, I changed the colors. We are not doing flat colors, we are not political. And I changed the font to our current font, and instead of the Love Lebanon, I called it the Fluff Beirut because I thought that it was lighter and it sounded better. So, with $150, he found a factory, and the factory produced our very first set of 300 the Fluff Beirut bracelets. Okay, so the bracelets are made. Now, how are we going to get them out there? We need a story. I was too far from Beirut, I was here, and I wanted to make movies about how I saw the city, but I couldn't. And Instagram was just coming out at the time. So from here, my house on Claremont Street near the Rose Bowl, um, we started a hashtag. And we came up with a very simple set of rules. Find beauty, capture it, share it on hashtag with Love Beirut. That's all you gotta do. Do not complain, do not share bad news. Just share the 1% of you know, that little magical moment every single day. And this is the result. People shared life, and this is what my hometown is like. It's about food, beaches, playing, youth, skiing. For example, there, there were surfers up north that nobody knew about. And after they started sending their pictures to us, people became to know that there's a surfing culture growing up north. There were four of them in 2012, there's 28 surfers. <laughs> I know it's too little for California. <laughs> <laughs> so the pictures got 10 million likes online, and uh, our follower base grew and grew. Our principle was to crowdsource content and to curate it every day. We reposted five to eight images, and this is how we kept growing our follower base. Anybody landing home started sending us a picture, and it became a game for people. Everybody wanted to be featured, everybody wanted to be reposted. So they, you know, they put in a lot of efforts into their images. For example, this guy found an old bill and went to the old citadel and took a picture of it. He won five bracelets, and he got reposted. <laughs> The bracelet has traveled to countries of the world, uh, from visitors coming to Beirut and going out. And every day before coming to school, I drove to the post office, dropped a few of them um, to people you know, in India, in Swiss Alps, in New York. Just received this from Ecuador and Bolivia. And this is all the Love Beirut bracelets. We received more love in a few hours of launching our Snapchat than being on Instagram for two years. What's awesome about Snapchat is that people don't think twice about what they send you. It's not staying on their profile. They're not building a social image for themselves when they're sending you content. So they don't think what's in their hearts. Instantly, they send it to you. Our bracelet caught the attention of people like uh, Sir Richard Branson and Rupert Grant. And in 2014, the Ministry of Tourism was about to launch a campaign. And they heard about the Love, Love Beirut. There are studies that show that since we started, tourism has grown in Lebanon by 21%. They adopted the campaign, and the Love, Love, Love Lebanon became the official national campaign of the country. OK, so my rule was never to post ugly images. But then I wake up one morning here on Claremont Street, and I see this. So what do you want me to do? And at the time, we had 50,000 followers. Should I ignore it, deny it, or should I repost it? So what we ended up doing is I reposted the image, and I wrote under it, this is the situation. This is my favorite river up in the mountains. Um, who wants to come clean it with us next Saturday? Just write your email in a comment, and we will email you with all the details. An hour later, uh, I'm in class and I see 185 comments, emails, people wanting to volunteer. And poor Eddie in Beirut <laughs> now has to organize an event for <laughs> Saturday. <seven. laughs> so <laughs> he's good at bringing people together. Everyone got together, they organized an event, I sent out the newsletter. And next Saturday, 76 people went up to the river. An NGO uh, called Think Clean Lebanon was actually born out of the two of the volunteers that came with us. So Live Love now is run by people. It's really, we're not doing anything anymore. It's, it's a movement. 
Every village in Lebanon and every campus has a live love account. They share their environment, their village, their university, what's going on around them. It helps them build a community, and the bracelet is really what is tying them all together. Brands wanted to partner with us very early on because of how many followers we had. I was very reluctant um, to have a commercial aspect to live love, but then we thought, hey, but how can we use brands and their power and their money to create social impact? With the garbage situation, we were approached by Uber, and what we ended up doing is having volunteers and Uber cars around the city, and Uber added the third option, if you're in Lebanon, you're going to see Uber recycle. And if you call an Uber, our volunteers are going to come to your doorstep, they're going to take your garbage, and they're going to take it themselves to the recycling facilities. Because the government is not picking up the garbage, so somebody has to do it, and our volunteers are, have been doing it uh, as of a month ago now. And this is the kind of comment we received. With Renault, the French car company, they wanted to market their new Clio. So what we ended up doing is placing the Clio all over the country next to schools and universities, because that's where most of our followers are. And um, we created a campaign called Clio Plant Slab. Everybody who found the red Clio took a picture and hashtagged. For every single picture that was tagged, Renault had to plant a tree. So one photo equals a tree. And this way, we planted a forest, and Renault got their marketing, and people had loads of fun. And they also won many prizes, including the bracelet <laughs> from the Olympics. <laughs> As you can imagine, Lula started picking up in other countries and cities. First, the neighboring ones, the of Egypt, started very early on, as well as the of Jordan. Now there's the of Rio, the of Venezuela, and even in the oddest of places, the of Syria. So you wouldn't think, but people in Syria still go to the market. They still smell spices and think of capturing this moment and sending it to you on a hashtag. They still ride their bikes. They still see steel art as uh, street art and they send it to you in a picture. It's, it's quite amazing to me. The Love Syria started a month ago and it's already at 4,000 followers. The Love Armenia is a, one of the, our fastest growing communities as well. The Love Rio. So, this is our newest project and it's the Love the World. We started an account to curate um, all of our other accounts. And we're doing it as a partnership with an artist called Z Zadi Haidat. She's Lebanese. This little character is, is traveling to one different city every week. So here he landed in Peru. This was last Monday. Two weeks ago, he landed in Porto Prince, Haiti. And there we shed a light on the modern situation and uh, amazing nonprofits that are working hard in the field out there. So this, this is the love of the world. So the bracelet, because I really think the bracelet is at the heart of Live Love. We don't sell it in any stores. That's not the point. Uh, the bracelet is a symbol. It's a tool to tie everyone together. So people around the world choose where our bracelet profits go. We only sell it on our website and in select festival and events where we are present. So anyone can submit their project and people vote. The project with the most likes takes the money. Again, the principle is that people are shaping the love. So this is it. And today I have special live love bracelets for you all. So come see me after this and follow our news on liveloftheworld.com. Thank you.